let's get right back into it. Um, I'd like to call Tina Baker Taylor on the Tina Baker Taylor to the stage from GDF. She's going to talk about best practices from global digital finance. Get up for Tina. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> um, so I am Tina Baker-Taylor. I am the Executive Director of Global Digital Finance. Um, GDF, as I mentioned earlier, is a industry membership body. Um, we're global, and we collaborate with policymakers and industry participants primarily to um, construct interoperable global standards and best practices for crypto asset participants. Um, we do this in partnership with uh, regulators and policymakers, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, a little later. So today, I want to give you a quick overview of where we're at today in the token market, um, and key themes and trends that are impacting the digital asset adoption and, and, and the regulation today. So this past year in the crypto market, it's been a mix of kind of fun and FOMO. And we're beginning to see the, the shoots of crypto spring. Sorry about this mic. Um, so the crypto winter brought really about a cleansing, right? So we had a number of projects leave the space. Um, a number of projects kind of fell apart, which I think has really left us in a better position overall with the quality of, of projects that we are working with now. Um, and it also brought about a re-architecting and a refocus on governance and compliance. Um, the markets are still quite volatile. Uh, institutions are not entering the space in, in a way that you know, maybe we predicted that they would a few years ago. Um, and regulators have started to take a very active role in policy development. Oh, I'll give you some examples of that later. Um, we're also starting to see a significant increase in regulatory enforcement action. Um, so in the past, you know, you could kind of do what you were going to do and nobody was going to stop you and we're starting to see that change. Um, so let's take a look at where we come from. Um, so this illustration is a little old. It was produced by Elementus last year, um, and it shows the growth. It should show the growth. There we go. It shows the growth um, over the, uh, the token market from January 2014, um, and then in August, once this kind of starts going, you, you can see that you know it's quite slow growing um, from 2014 to 2016, and then we start to see quite a big explosion. Um, coming up in a minute here, when we have a proliferation of, of tokens um, and it becomes you know, exponential explosion. And that really was based on the rise of the utility token and, and ICOs. So it should just boom a second. Sorry, I've mistimed this a little bit. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty interesting, right? So like nothing happens and all of a sudden, kaboom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this next slide, similarly, um, we're going to look at the token market cap. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we're going to see the, the rise of the, the tokens in trading pairs. So the gray tokens are those that were issued from 2014 to 2017. And then we start to see significant trading activity for newly issued tokens around June 2017. So the, today the token market cap is around uh, 238 billion um, with more than 2,000 plus tokens. However, many of them are not active. And this is really a result of a mix of challenges. Some projects probably never intended to come to market some projects didn't win the crypto winter, um, and some, quite honestly, were potentially a scam from the start. And so today we're starting to see that, that market proliferate with new token types as well. So we've talked a lot about stable coins today, um, asset-backed tokens that are, that are pegged, 
um, and new financial asset tokens uh, or security tokens, debt tokens, equity tokens. Um, I'm going to focus quite a lot today on what I see as the major challenges impacting wider digital asset adoption, and to me that's really market integrity. And the three elements which I think have a relational effect on each other are regulation, liquidity, and institutional adoption. Both institutional volumes and liquidity are impacted by regulation. Liquidity is impacted by lower volumes, which can be bolstered with institutional investment, but the catch-22 is that the institutional interest is affected by low liquidity today, and so there's a chicken and egg effect here. But at the heart of all of these challenges really, to me, personally, is market integrity. Regulators are challenged with protecting consumers, and they are unsure that the digital market uh, today operates efficiently and without manipulation. And as, and, <clears throat> Excuse me, are these markets transparent and fair? Um, personally, I think we have a long way to go to ensuring that, and I think there are a number of things that we can do that will increase um, people's confidence in the markets. But today, I think consumers are still at risk of being the sole financial assets that they don't truly understand. Um, and you know, as regulators are looking at whether or not the market is actually ready for sophisticated instruments like ETFs, market integrity is one of the things that they're looking at specifically. As regulatory regimes have been slow to develop, um, this also causes regulated institutions pause to enter as we're talking really about banks. So, you know, who feels confident entering a market when the news is filled with stories of scams, malfeasance, and unprofessional, profession, unprofessional conduct? So going back to what um, George from BeQuant was saying earlier, the professionalism around our industry, I think, is under scrutiny. And so continued stories, um, like the ones that I've kind of captured here, create mistrust, and that inhibits adoption. Um, here's an example of Crypto Compares Exchange benchmarking report. I uh, highly urge you to take a look at it. It comes out quarterly. Um, and this is just a snapshot of um, what is clearly wash trading. So you've got kind of that comb at the bottom, which shows you know, patterns of trading which don't at all relate to the volatility at the top. And we see this over and over. Um, this is from the same report. Um, so Crypto Compare has rated exchanges. They publish their methodology. Um, so you can go um, online and take a look at the methodology that gives the exchanges the ratings that they have. So basically, I think A through B minus, A through B um, is in the, in the green, and um, going further down into the, the lack of transparency, you'll see kind of the, the orange and, and red. And what's interesting about this chart is, you can see kind of earlier on, um, there was more transparency than there actually is today. So we're starting to see a rise of activity um, that is actually counterproductive. Um, this is another interesting chart from the same report. Um, and what is interesting here is we're looking at jurisdictions that um, the methodology that Crypto Compares come up with gives us an indication of the markets that have the highest degree of integrity. What I think is compelling about this particular slide is the markets that are green are regulated markets predominantly. So there is a correlation between having standards, guidelines, rules in place and having people subscribe to them. And I understand from a DeFi perspective that you know, we think that we should be able to kind of operate you know, in this trustless environment without any rules. But if you have a look at some of those markets where we don't, um, there's you know, a, a, a lack of, of integrity within them. Yeah. The green dot to the left. I uh, know the British Virgin Islands actually is the the big red dot. Um, I think it's it's one of the islands. Yeah, I can. I, I'll look later. I'll, I have the thing. It probably just hasn't resolved well. Okay, so um, moving on to regulation. So from from our perspective, as an industry association. The current regulatory landscape can be difficult for market participants to navigate, um, but it's equally difficult for regulators who are charged with protecting consumers. And regulators are really waking up. So we're seeing a significant increase in regulators issuing uh, regulatory guidance and framework. 
Um, so most recently, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Hong Kong regulator has finally published regulatory guidelines for exchanges. Um, and going to another report from Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, this kind of gives us an overview of how regulators see the space today. And what I think is really interesting about this is on the left you'll see all of the different types of government agencies that have a role to play or an interest within this space. And there's quite a lot of them, right? And then on the right you have an, an idea of the authorities that are involved in actually regulating the space. So there's the point of this slide is just to show you that there's a lot of stakeholders it's not just particularly one jurisdiction or one, you know, the central bank or just the regulator. There's a number of entities that are involved in creating these frameworks. Josh, I can send you this when I find it. <laughs> um, one interesting statistic that comes out of this report that I think is, and I highly encourage you to read it, it's actually a very interesting read. Um, they surveyed 23 different major market regulators, and 70% of them were cut and pasting. So basically taking existing regulation and just applying it to crypto assets. And only 17% of them um, were looking at net new frameworks. So from a GDF perspective, this is something that we're hopefully trying to implement so that it's more balanced. Um, again, here we're looking at different jurisdictions and their, their role within the regulatory space. But the most important is the um, graph on the right, or sorry, on the left, which shows you all the different types of um, taxonomies that regulators are using. And what's really interesting is that sometimes within the same agency, they'll use different terms. So is it a virtual asset? Is it a crypto asset? Is it a cryptocurrency? And this um, is still a struggle. You know, years after um, I started working on the first taxonomy that I worked on, that we're still having taxonomy problems and trying to ensure that we're all talking about the same thing. So um, that leads me to, to GDF. Um, so how can industry participants um, influence the development of legislation, regulation, and general governance? So GDF promotes the adoption of standards, as I mentioned earlier. Our community develops these uh, conduct recommendations with um, each other, um, within global working groups, in a shared forum with policymakers and regulators. Regulators uh, and other government agencies, uh, academics, industry participants, incumbents, so banks, for instance, and uh, other types of financial institutions. Um, are involved in our community. So we are, we're really trying to look at the convergence of traditional finance, alternative finance, and what it's going to take to uh, ensure that we have some mainstream adoption. So this gives you a sense of our community today. Um, we have a patron board of directors, which really influences our strategic direction. Um, and that Hobi is one of those patron members. Um, and B. Quant, who was on the panel earlier, is on our advisory council, which helps us develop our code of conduct and decide what the key things are that we should be addressing as a community and really kind of separate the noise from things that are actually going to be transformative in the industry. We also have a number of partners that we work with, so other national trade bodies um, and members associations as well. Our extended community it includes regulatory observers. Um, we have about 50 agencies today that we work with. This is just a selection of them. Um, it also includes banks and, and academics, and all of these people participate in the development of our, our codes of conduct, our policy papers, um, and any kind of uh, policy recommendations that we make. So, um, our regulatory outreach um, is one of the key things that GDF conducts. We respond to policy um, papers, we respond to consultations to influence development of those policies. Um, for instance, the FCA recently, uh, last week, concluded a consultation on fees that they will assess for the new AML D5 guidelines in Europe. Um, and that's really important considering that you've got 52 countries of Europe and if every country decides that they're going to issue a fee and you're trying to operate across Europe, um, that can get very expensive. So is there going to be some kind of passporting? Um, if you have a different, let's say you have an e-money license, um, will that be covered under the fee? Um, and 
I literally received an email yesterday from the FCA after they received our response, um, and they've asked us to come in and talk to them with some of our members about how they might, um, you know, reevaluate what their current plans were. So that's great. Um, so we do a lot of education with them. We conduct boot camps with them. Um, oftentimes, we will help them form the questions within consultations so that they ensure they get the answers that they're after. Um, so driving self-governance is essentially what, what global digital finance is, is trying to do. Um, I think it is unreasonable to expect that we will ever have global harmonization of regulatory policies across the world. That's just never going to happen. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't fill some of those regulatory arbitrage gaps with some conduct standards. Um, our community, as I mentioned earlier, is completely community-led. Um, so for instance, where we lead our market integrity working group, who is working on a code of conduct that will look at market manipulation, things like wash trading, um, how IEOs should be viewed, um, you know, disclosures, uh, market maker programs, all of those things that kind of go into market integrity across a marketplace. Um, so within those working groups, we have global participants, they're uh, shared bilaterally with regulators um, before they're shared with the community, and then again, they go up for global consultation. Um, and then the members have to adopt and ratify these codes of conduct because they're expected to adhere to them. So you saw this earlier. Um, I stole this from Alex. It's actually Alex's slide. Um, so this just gives you an example of one of our working groups. I should have picked another one. Um, but I think it's interesting, um, this particular working group, because there's such a wide mix of different types of market participants that are participating in forming um, a code of conduct for third-party custodians, um, for uh, self-custody, um, as well as API standardization. So today we have eight codes of conduct uh, that are ratified and the community can attest to. They cover everything from trading platforms, token issuance, stable coins, funds, etc. Um, you can see in the middle the, the codes that we're working on. If anybody's interested in getting involved in any of these working groups, definitely send us an email. They're open um, to the entire community and the pipeline of the things that we'll be working on next. Um, we also have a registry so that firms can, again, publicly attest their commitment to the code of conduct. Um, long term, we'll be looking uh, potentially at how we work with regulators to share information with them in some kind of dashboard format um, that has some kind of key metric indicators about um, how companies are trending against this. And that's what our registration uh, page looks like if you ever want to go on and have a look at any of our members' assessments. And that, uh, oops, that's me. If anyone wants, we have time for one question. If anyone wants to, wants to ask something to Tiana. Alex. We hear you, man. Uh, Tiana, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, you know, we have uh, been looking at um, decentralized stable coins today, uh, lately. And um, we, we mentioned that it is kind of thing which is under uh, rudder of regulators. But we, we all know that if something is under rudder, at some point it becomes under rudder. So what's your take on that and uh, how actually you, you think uh, it would uh, work out? Are you saying underwritten? Under under rudder. Under rudder of regulator. Oh, under, under the radar. radar. Under sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this is my fault. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> so so uh, let me make sure I understand your question. So if something is decentralized, is it under the radar of regulators? Is that the question? Specifically decentralized stable coins, like MakerDAO and yeah. uh, USDT stable coin and all these defined uh, interesting projects. Uh, no. So they're well aware of what those projects are. We get asked a lot of questions uh, specifically around things like Baker or decentralized exchanges. Um, they, they used to be quite a big concern uh, for regulators, mostly because they just didn't understand how these things worked and um, applying kind of AML requirements to them. Um, but I think going back to what Jocelyn was saying earlier about you know how Maker's being used, 
I think once we start to see use cases in place where you know, if part of the merchant acquisition um, project or, or, or pipeline includes some way of ensuring that you know the dye that's being used is is being used for purposes that they're intended to be used for, um, and there isn't like a big proliferation of you know an an un, unknown let's say there's let's say there's a, a million dye, and only ten percent of it is being used to actually pay for things, right? What is the other, you know, ninety percent of that being used for? So um, I think those would be the things that cause questions. But ultimately, if something is fully, completely decentralized, as we've seen with Bitcoin, I mean, there's not a lot you can do. We're not going to regulate technology, um, at least not today. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, guys.